So this morning, uh, we're going to take a little break from the Gospel of Luke, and uh, we have the, the privilege to hear from Joe Beyond, elder here at this church, and our brother in Christ, who's going to bring us the word of the Lord this morning from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. And we're going to be looking at the message, verses 30 through 44, uh, the feeding of the 5,000. And I'm going to read that uh, for us now. Hear with me the word of the Lord. The apostles then rendezvoused with Jesus, and they reported on all that they had done and taught. And Jesus said, come off by yourselves. Let's take a break and get a little rest. For there was constant coming and going, and they didn't even have time to eat. So they got in the boat, and they went off to a remote place by themselves. Someone saw them going, and the word got around. From the surrounding towns, people went on foot running, and they got there ahead of them. And when Jesus arrived, he saw this huge crowd. At the sight of them, his heart broke. Like sheep with no shepherd they were. And he went right to work teaching them. When his disciples thought that this had gone on long enough, it was now quite late in the day, they interrupted. We are a long way out in the country, and it's very late. Pronounce a benediction and send these folks off so they can get some supper. And Jesus said, you do it. Fix supper for them. And they replied, are you serious? You want us to go and spend a fortune on food for their supper? But he was quite serious. How many loaves of bread do you have? Take an inventory. That didn't take long. Five, they said, plus two fish. Jesus got them all to sit down in groups of 50 or 100. They looked like a patchwork quilt of wildflowers spread out on the green grass. And he took the five loaves and two fish and lifted his face to heaven in prayer. Blessed, broke, and gave the bread to the disciples. And the disciples, in turn, gave it to the people. He did the same with the fish. And they all ate their fill. The disciples gathered twelve baskets of leftovers. More than five thousand were at the supper. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. Good morning. I'm not a teaching elder, so you don't see me here often. I'm more comfortable sitting back there playing the cello. So, nonetheless, the Lord has um, impressed upon me words that I would like to share with you this morning. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord. Help me to speak what your people need to hear, not just what they like to hear. Amen. I spent a great part of my working life in the service industry, where I frequently hear the word service standard being mentioned. Now, service standard is a norm set to ensure quality and consistency in customer service. Let me give you two examples. Now, Paul is a well-known French bakery chain, but not many of you know that if you visit any of these stores 15 minutes before closing, you can get anything there that remains there for half price. Whoa. (laughs) Now, whatever is left after that at closing is donated to charity. Now, this is a key part of Paul's service standards. All his products are freshly made the same morning. During our time in Hong Kong, I have a Hong Kong sister here. (laughs) Yeah, so my family would sometimes order pizza for dinner. Now, I usually would order from Domino's. Actually, I quite prefer Pizza Hut's pan pizza. (laughs) But I still do Domino because I like its service guarantee. Now, if the pizzas fail to reach your doorsteps within an hour, do do you have it in the U.S.? Same, right? An hour, right? 30 minutes. Oh, 30 minutes. Oh, Hong Kong is a bit more more, uh, congested, yeah? (laughs) An hour, okay? You get pizza for free. So, I know we Christians are not supposed to pray for traffic jams. 
but I, I was tempted sometimes after I placed an order <laughs> for traffic jams. I think I did get once, got it free once. This too exemplifies a service standard. Now today I'm going to draw a parallel between the service standards you will see in the world, in the corporate world, and the one that God would like us who serve him to have. To do that, I'm going to refer to a very well-known passage in Mark 6, which Pastor Mike has just read to you. But it's going to be a little, very different focus. Now, before we get into the account, I should highlight two other events that took place earlier in Mark 6. The first, from verse 7 to 13, It's what may be the first short-term mission trip in church history. Now, we see Jesus sending out the disciples two by two to different parts of Judea to do mission work. The second event, from verse 14 to 29, is more somber. It is the execution of John the Baptist, whom, as many of you will know, is Jesus' cousin. Now, born six months apart from each other, the two probably grew up seeing a lot of each other. Their close relationship adds a certain pathos and emotional weight to the narrative. Now, we read in Matthew 14, Jesus then goes alone to a solitary place to mourn for John The sequence of these two events leads us to verse 30. Now, here we see the disciples returning from the mission trip, excited to tell Jesus all that they have seen and done. Now, despite Jesus' lingering grief over John's death, he rallies himself to not just listen attentively, but also to affirm the enthusiastic reports. 14 years ago, Trev and I led a short-term mission trip from ICP. We had, we, we, to run an English camp in the slum area in Beijing. The day we arrived, there was a flash flood caused by heavy rainfall. Now, Trev would confirm this. He and I had to wade through knee-deep flood water to get to the event site. Now, I tried not to look too closely at all the stuff that was floating in the water, including everything that came out of the open sewage systems. Now, even so, this plus many other things, new things, novel things that we had experienced during the trip to China were not half as challenging as those the disciples have to face. Long hours of teaching, healing the sick, restoring sight to the blind, making the lame walk, and cussing out nasty demons from tormented souls. And they did the level best and gave everything they have got. So by the time they get to Jesus, they are surely completely exhausted And our Lord knows this. So he says to them, come off by yourself. Let's go somewhere. Let's take a break. Get some rest. Excited to hear this, the disciples board the boat with Jesus and they set sail to what may be the first pastoral staff retreat in history. (laughs) However, their plans soon unravel as they reach the other shore. A big welcoming party awaits. The crowd that sees them leave has rightly guessed the boat's destinations and then runs ahead of them by land to meet them there. Now, faced with this unplanned situation, Jesus may respond in a number of ways. He may order the boat to immediately turn around and head out to sea again. And this time, careful to take evasive actions to make sure the crowd cannot guess accurately where they are heading. Or, 
he may be a little more considerate. He will instruct the disciples to tell the crowd that his schedules this weekend is full. Uh, Come back next week. Come back next week. But when Jesus sees the crowd, his heart breaks for them. They look confused and lost. He then decides to stay and teach and minister to them. The first lesson we learn about God's service standard is this. We should serve with compassion, not compulsion. Now Jesus in his compassion prioritized the immediate needs of the crowd over his initial plans. Now if Jesus is working, of course the disciples have to also. But they do not do it willingly. How do we know that? Just read verse 35 and 36. When the disciples thought this has gone on long enough, it was now quite late in the day. They interrupted. We are a long way, sir, out in the country, and this is very late. Pronounce a benediction and send these folks away. Now, interesting to see, sometimes we Christians can even use a benediction like, God bless you, go in peace, (laughs) as a way to tell people it's time for them to leave. (laughs) Now, church, I hope you don't do that to anyone. (laughs) They interrupted. When they come to Jesus, Jesus is likely still teaching or praying for somebody. Now, in the culture of that time, it is rude, literally unheard of for disciples to come to the master to interrupt them in what they, whatever they are doing. Now, that the disciples would do that just goes to show how annoyed they are with the crowd. You know, in a way, I can empathize with that. This crowd just disrupted my, our plans for the wonderful weekend retreat with our Lord Jesus. On top of that, we have to work all day on what is supposed to be our day off. The disciples came with a plan, but that plan is an unworkable one. The 5,000 only accounts for adult men. Now, if you add in women and children, it will be more like 9,000. Imagine a crowd of 100 100 times of ICP descending upon Novi Smikov food court. Just imagine that. There won't be enough food just to feed a small portion of those people. What about those who have no money? Now don't forget, this is not Prague, capital city, but a place the disciples themselves describe as a remote countryside. There is no way the crowd can find enough food to eat by themselves. Had Jesus agreed to the disciples' plans, there is no question that the crowd would go away hungry. But hey, do they care? Their priority right now is get on with dinner preparation, eat, and then catch up with some sleep. What is lacking here is an empathy and concern for the crowd's immediate need to have something for dinner. Not that they would even think of coming up with such an impractical plan says a lot about their true service attitude of not serving with compassion. This is one to get rid of the crowd. And this brings us to the second lessons in God's service standard. Very easy, there are only two lessons. <laughs> Beware of the job description syndromes. I would suggest another reason the disciples behave this way is because they do not consider feeding the crowd a part of the job as disciples. Giving up life luxury? Certainly. Sleeping rough in the open? No problem. 
Trekking for miles from village to village? Sure. Standing all day to teach and minister? Can do. Praying for the sick and casting out demons? Amen. But planning the logistic of feeding those who come to listen to Jesus? Hmm. This is not exactly in our portfolio or something spiritual that we disciples should be concerned about. Now, somewhere in the head is this notion that certain tasks are less spiritual than others. The author Eugene Peterson notes this inherent flaw in Christian thinking in his book, The Jesus Way. One of the bad habits we picked up early in our lives is separating things and people into secular and sacred. I'm going to name some names now. Two weeks ago, the kitchen faucet at the bridge center broke. When Pava heard this, he went there late one evening after a long day at work to get it fixed. He then turned in a receipt for the replacement part. So when I asked for his bank account to send the money to, he wrote back, send it to ICP. I was touched by the, the servant heart I see in Pavel, who served willingly and sacrificially. When someone in ICP needed help, to move some furniture from one flat to another. Benjamin offered his car. I see him <laughs> sinking in the seat. <laughs> now, together with Alex, they went on one Sunday after church to do the moving. Church, hear this. God does not see some things we do more holy than others. We are told in 1 Corinthians 10, whether we eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all in the glory of God. And in, Corinthians, and in Colossians 3.17, whatever you do, whether in words or deeds, do it all in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now what Pavel, Benjamin, and Alex have done is no less spiritual and value in God's sight than the worship team leading worship here this morning. They are all services of worship pleasing to God. Now this job description syndrome can be very detrimental to Christian service. Now don't get me wrong. A job description is helpful to help us get an idea of a scope of work you are asked to do. Now it is perfectly reasonable to ask to see one. If you have been asked to teach Sunday school, or to be a deacon. However, in all these job descriptions, there is always one last clause at the very end. And it is written in invisible ink. <laughs> or any other task the Lord deems necessary for you to do. Actually, you do see that also in many commercial contracts. <laughs> all right? <laughs> Adrian will confirm that. <laughs> I don't want you to think that every job that needs done in church is yours to do. Look, now there is a time and a place to say no. And also, you are not the only one with a servant's heart. Give others the opportunity to serve also. Last Christmas, I asked Minung, if she would help to coordinate the Angel Tree Project, which is to send Christmas gifts to children whose, pa whose parents are in prison. She initially was hesitant, but later agreed, and she did a brilliant job. All 60 kids we adopted were sponsored. Praise God. With a little help from Pastor Might, I understand. <laughs> Thank you, Minung. Thank you for stepping up. Friends, the next time you're asked to help to take on an assignment that is not in your normal scope of work, don't be so quick to say no. 
Pray about it first. For all you know, God may be using such an assignment to better equip you for service. Now, aware of the disciples' lack of compassion and the tendency to compartmentalize tasks, Jesus uses the occasion to teach them a lesson on his service standard. Now, he does that by giving them a task that is outside the scope of work. He asks them to fix dinner for them. Now, Jesus then goes about setting the conditions to enable them to learn the lessons. He does that by performing a miracle to provide enough food to feed everyone. Now, our focus today is not on that miracle, nor the little boy who offered the food. Now, let's do some math now to find out how long the lesson takes. Total crowd size, 9,000. Disciples are paired up into six teams. Each team observed 1,500 people. Now, I have learned a few things about operational efficiency from my times in the service industry. Now, if I were one of the disciples, I would strongly, strongly suggest to Jesus, look, there's a lot of people out there, right? Let's do it the best way, right? The best way to do it is self-service. We set up six serving points, six serving points, men by six pairs of disciples, right? The, the crowd will form six lines, six lines, okay? So line up six lines. Each line has 1,500 people, right? To come forward to collect the loaf and the fish. Now, for those who want seconds helping, sure, go back to the end of the line. That would be the quickest way to feed 9,000 people. Would you not agree? Mm -hmm. It seems Jesus has different ideas. He wants this to be a deluxe, full-service dining. Five star. The crowd is to be comfortably seated across the hillside, spread out, so the disciples have to walk. Right? With the disciples turned waiters, lugging their full basket of fish, or bread, and go row by row to serve them. Now, assuming it takes 10 seconds to hand out a fish and two loaves of bread to each person, and then move to the next person, it will take 15,000 seconds, or 250 minutes, or 4 hours, 10 minutes, to serve all 15 thousand people and this is not accounting for the trips they must make back to Jesus when their baskets are empty I'm giving you this blow by blow account so that you may better appreciate the magnitude of the task the disciples are made to engage in by Jesus now, let's say the disciples come to Jesus at 6. It takes an hour to organize a crowd. Four hours, 10 minutes to serve the crowd. 50 minutes to collect leftovers. So they do also need to clear the tables. Another hour to send the crowds away. The disciples' original plan is to be comfortably seated for dinner by... 7 p.m. Instead, it will be another six hours before they finally sit down to eat. And guess what they had for dinner? <laughs> Leftovers. Leftovers. <laughs> now, I hope none of us here have to go through anything half as rigorous in order for us to learn the lesson of service standards. Let me clarify. The other tasks that I referred to earlier don't usually happen frequently. The crowd don't get free meals. They don't get free food, okay, every time they come to hear Jesus. The Gospels only record one other incident of Jesus 
feeding the crowd. Angel tree takes place only once a year. Pastor Mike and I recently drove 800 kilometers to make an urgent pastoral visit. It took an entire day. But we don't do it all the time. And Pastor Mike will confirm uh, will that, you know, we, the eight hours we were on the road driving, we had a great time fellowshipping and sharing. I got to find out a lot more about him. <laughs> Now, some of you will ask now, how do we measure kingdom service standard in God's economy? Is there a precise metric? Is it the quality of coffee you're going to get out there in the lobby? Or church membership? Or collection? The money we collected meeting the target budget? What we see is the measure that God uses here is simple and straightforward. It is found right in the passage. When we apply the service standard modeled by Jesus, the result will always be as with the crowd. They all ate and were satisfied. Friends, the ministry we do the people we serve, do they go away feeling happier? More hopeful? More comforted? Are they refreshed and renewed through your work? That is the ultimate measure of kingdom service standard. Those who are happy and satisfied may not be the ones serving. For sure, Busily serving that night are 12 grumpy and unhappy disciples. If I were Mark, I might add an extra line to verse 42. But the disciples have not eaten and were not satisfied. That's, I stress, that's my addition, okay? It's not from the Bible. I would add that if I were Mark. Now, one important spiritual insight we may draw from here is this. Now, we have a God who knows us better than we know ourselves. Even if we sometimes come to serve with mixed motives and negative attitudes, God, in His grace, may still work through our imperfection to accomplish His purpose of blessing others. Isn't it great to hear this? You see it right here. It is because God is infinitely patient. He's not finished with us yet. He knows our frailties and inadequacies. If we will only allow him, he will continue to work in your life and in my life to make us more and more aligned to his will and purpose. By God's grace, that situation did work out well in the end. The crowd ate and was satisfied. Romans 8.28 reminds us that all things work for the good for those who love God. On that day, by the Sea of Galilee, God works to turn the outcome of the disciples below par service standard into something good. This is because he knows that despite the many misgivings, flawed intentions, and mixed motives, deep, deep down in their hearts, they do love Jesus and are committed to serve him to the end. If these disciples were with us today, they would fit right in among those of us who serve in ICP. Now, Jesus does not wait until the disciples have gained a certain level of proficiency before engaging them in his work. They learn on the job, serving. Friends, don't wait until you have got everything sorted out. Right intentions, 
pure motives and correct attitude before you start serving. Begin today by offering your time, talents, and other resources to serve. The best way to learn the service standard that pleases God is not to listen to more sermons like mine, but by serving. Today, God continues to call disciples to follow Him. As His disciples, we are to serve and be prepared always to make sacrifices and adjustments in our lives for Him. Serving Him will always cost us time, effort, and sometimes even financially. One day, when it's all said and done, you will know that it's all worth it. The disciples may have worked hard late into the night, but come the next morning, the crowd will be gone. They will still have their beloved master to themselves. They can still enjoy the quiet and peace, including the rest of the pastoral staff retreat. I close by addressing three groups of people. First, to those not yet involved in serving. By the grace of God, I urge you to deal with whatever that is holding you back so that you may begin today to experience the joy of serving. Talk to Pastor Mike or one of the elders or the deacons. Find out how you may contribute. Do it while you still can. Once a pastor from the UK went to China to visit underground house churches. At a prayer meeting, an old man stood up to speak. In a trembling voice, full of passion and conviction, he said, Brothers and sisters, let us work while there is still light. For when night comes, no one can work. He was blind. Today, I stand before you to ask, would you, would you, would you? One day, we will all stand before someone else. And he will ask you, have you, have you, have you? I speak next to those already actively serving. Thank you so much for stepping up in various capacities. I especially commend those whose work is behind the scene in tasks that few people will see. The Lord sees the work that you do and he will honor your sacrifice and labor of love. Now only make sure that as you serve, you will always carry with you the compassion of Jesus. Serving gladly and willingly. When you do that, you will no longer look too closely at your job descriptions. Finally, I speak to a few very dear and special people. You may be a career missionary or someone who has given much in service of God. But you have run out of juice. Your well is dry. Your nerves are frayed. Your health is failing. Today, the Lord may be telling you, come off by yourself. Go, take a break. Get a little rest. Don't be concerned that your current ministry will crumble without you. Just look out the window. Lying there are lots of people who thought they were indispensable. Go away somewhere, solitary, for a personal retreat. 
Take some rest to restore your margins so that you may come back to serve again better. And reach out to Pastor Mike or to any of the elders. We will be glad to pray with you and for you. I wish to end today's sermon by sharing a song that I would like to be sung at my own funeral. It, I hope it resonates with you such that it resonates with me. When it's all been said and done There is just one thing that matters What do I do my best to live for truth? Did I live my life for you? When it's all been said and done all my treasures will mean nothing Only what I've done for love's reward Will stand the test of time Lord, your mercy is so great that you look beyond our weakness And find purest gold in my clay Turning sinners into saints And I always sing your praise Here on earth and ever after For you've shown me heavens, my true home when it's all been said and done You're my life when life is gone When it's all been said and done There is just one thing that matters did I do my best to live for truth? Did I live my life for you? Lord, I live my life for you.